Welcome. Today I would like to talk about elementary graph algorithms. And this will be a three-part series. So in this first part, we're going to look at what is a graph, how I'm going to store graphs. And then in the second part, we're going to look at breadth-first search, so a graph algorithm. And then in the third part, depth-first search, and as an application of that topological sorting. Let's first look at some examples of graphs. So the first example here is a travel network. So we have cities and they're connected by, let's say, streets, or if this is a rail network, by railway connections. So let's say it is a rail network. Let's say I'm in the city down there. I want to travel up here. Then I might be asking how many stops does it take to get up there? So this already would be an algorithmic question on this network. And another example here is a computer network. So computers and they're connected. And the third example is we have processes that we want to execute, but there are dependencies between the processes. So the arrow here says process one needs to be executed before we can do process four. And now the question is, is there a consistent way of ordering these processes? What is a graph? A graph is a pair V comma E where V is a set of vertices of the graph and E is a set of edges of the graph. So vertices also often are called nodes and edges also arcs, but we will be talking about vertices and edges. And an edge is a pair of vertices. So for instance, in the first example, we had cities as vertices and then the edges were connections between pairs of cities. Or we had processes as vertices and dependency between two processes as edges. And if we have an edge u comma v, then we say v is adjacent to u. In general, we distinguish two types of graphs, undirected graphs and directed graphs. So in an undirected graph, we consider the edges as unordered pairs. So the edge uv is the same as the edge vu. So here we see an example of an undirected graph. In an undirected graph, we also typically do not allow self loop. So we do not allow an edge from a vertex to itself. In contrast, in a directed graph, we see the edges as ordered pairs. So uv is not the same as vu. And when we draw it, we show that the edge goes from u to v by having an arrow pointing towards v. In this case, we also allow self loops, as you see in this example down there. So we have undirected graphs and directed graphs. Let's look at some more basic terminology. The degree of a vertex is a number of edges attached to that vertex. A path is a sequence of vertices such that there's always an edge from one vertex to the next. So from V0 to V1, from V1 to V2, and so on. A cycle is a path that starts and ends at the same vertex. And the length of a path is simply the number of edges on that path. Let's do that by an example. In the example to the left, so in the undirected graph, the green path is a path of length 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4, always joining one vertex of the path with the next one and so on. The red edges form a cycle, a path that starts and ends at the same vertex of length 3, because it has three edges. In the directed graph, we the green path is a path of length 1, 2, 3, 4. Now, for instance, the red edges do not form a path because both point up here, so I cannot go 1, 2 to here, because for that I would have to have the edge in the other direction. Let's also look at degree here. So here, this vertex, for instance, has a degree of 1, 2, 3 three because there are three edges here. Then another notion that we're going to look at is the distance between vertices and the distance is the length of the shortest path. So for instance, if I take these two vertices, the distance between those vertices is two. I mean, there is this path of length four, the green one, but there is also a shorter path going one, two, connecting those two. In the directed graph here, so if this is u and that is v, then the distance from u to v is again 1, 2, while the distance from v to u 
we say is infinity because from V I cannot get to U. Another important concept is connectivity. So an undirected graph is connected. Let's take this graph here. If there is a path between any pair of vertices. So no matter which pair of vertices I pick here, there is a path. So the overall graph here is not connected. And we call the connected parts of this graph, so these four parts, the connected components of this graph. For an undirected graph, there's a similar notion, namely the notion of strong connectivity. And a graph is strongly connected if for any pair of vertices, they are reachable from each other. So if I can go from U to V and from V to U. So the graph down here has two strongly connected components. So each of these components is strongly connected. So if I pick a vertex here and a vertex there, then indeed there is a path from the vertex up here down to the vertex down there and also a path going back to the initial vertex. In contrast, between those two connected components, I cannot go from here to this vertex and back. A special type of graph that we're interested in is a tree. So a tree is an undirected graph that is connected and acyclic. So it doesn't have a cycle. So here you see an example of a tree. There are no cycles and also the graph is connected. So this is a tree. One property of trees is that we exactly know how many edges it will have. Namely, if we have n vertices, we will have n minus one edges. So one edge less than we have vertices. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten vertices, nine edges. With fewer edges, it wouldn't be connected. With more edges, we would have a cycle. Another special type of graph we're interested in is a directed acyclic graph. So this is now in the directed graph setting. Again, we want to have it acyclic. We are not asking about connectivity. So this is an example of a directed acyclic graph. So you see already it doesn't look like a tree. For one, it doesn't need to be connected, but also this doesn't look like a tree. But there is no cycle. So this is not a cycle because from here to here, and then I cannot continue. So let's have a first quiz or actually an exercise. So your task is to draw a graph. It should have 12 edges. It should have at least six vertices. Six vertices should have degree exactly three. And if you use more vertices, then those should have degree at most two. And you should use as few vertices as possible. So how many vertices do you need? Eight, nine, 10, or 11. You can do this with nine vertices. So your graph most likely will do, look very different from my graph, but let me draw a graph. So, so far I have six vertices. They all have degree three, but I also only have nine edges. Now, if instead I have three additional vertices here, each of degree two, then this indeed gives me nine vertices and these have degree three, so six with degree three and three vertices of degree at most two, namely exactly two. Now you can wonder, is this the best we can do? Yes, it is, and how can we see that? So if you look at the sum of the degrees, now if I sum up all of the degrees, what I actually do is I'm going to count every edge twice, because this edge here contributes to the degree of this vertex and of that vertex. So every edge occurs in the sum of the degrees twice. So this is the same as two times the number of edges. Now I said I wanted to have 12 edges. So the sum of the degrees will be 24. So how can I reach 24? I have six vertices of degree three, but that only gives me 18 as sum of degrees. So to reach 24, and now I'm only allowed to use at most degree 2, I need at least three more 
vertices of degree 2. So only in this way I can reach 24 and that gives me 9 vertices. So with 8 vertices for instance I would only reach 22 so I could at most get 11 edges. Now we know what a graph is. Next we want to think about how do we store a graph. So how do we represent a graph? When we store a graph there are two aspects to consider. One, we want to have a compact representation, so not too much storage. But also, whatever algorithms we want to do, those we want to be able to execute efficiently using this representation. And we're going to see two representations. One is adjacency lists, and the other is an adjacency matrix. So here we have a graph. What is an adjacency list? for such a graph. Adjacency lists simply means that we have an array of lists. So for every vertex, so here we have vertices 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we have a linked list of the vertices that are adjacent to that vertex. So here in my graph for instance, I have vertex 1 here, adjacent to that 2 and 3. So I have here a linked list containing 2 and 3 for the vertex 1 or 5 has no adjacent vertices so I have an empty list. And this I can use for undirected graphs but I can also use it for directed graphs. So for instance if this is my directed graph now again I have 1 now only 2 is adjacent to 1 so I only store 2 here. In contrast if you look at the list for 3 then 1 and 2 are adjacent, so I have both of those in the linked list that I store for 3. And that's a graph we presented as adjacency lists. If I represent a graph as adjacency matrix, then I have a matrix of size number of vertices times number of vertices, and the entry aij is 1 if there's an edge between vertex i and vertex j, and 0 otherwise. So here for instance, again looking at 1, 2 and 3 are adjacent, so I have a 1 in column 2 and 3 of row 1. And again I can use this for undirected graphs, but I can also use this for directed graphs. So let's have our directed graph here. 2 is the only vertex adjacent to 1, therefore only 2 shows up in row 1, while in row 3 we have 1 and 2 adjacent to 3, so there's the 1 for 1 and 2, and all other entries, I'm not showing them here, all other entries are 0. And those are the two ways that we represent graphs, adjacency lists, adjacency matrix. So what are the advantages and disadvantages? So let's look at how much space do we need for adjacency lists. I store a list for every vertex, so I at least use order v space, but then I also store every adjacency, and that corresponds to order number of edges, so I have order v plus e space for adjacency lists. In contrast, in a matrix, I simply have a matrix of size v times v, so there I use order v squared space. So which representation is better in terms of space? So I will never have more than v squared edges. So in that regard, adjacency lists are never worse. I can have order v squared edges, so in that case both are similar in terms of space. Generally speaking, if my graph has very few edges, so and we call that the graph is sparse, then it is better to use adjacency lists. Let's have a look at some operations that we might need in algorithms. The first being listing all vertices adjacent to a given vertex u. So this is an operation that we actually will use quite frequently. And adjacency lists are perfectly made for this, because if I want to, for instance, list all vertices adjacent to 3, then I just have to go through the corresponding adjacency list. And that will take me order degree of that vertex time. In contrast, if I want to do the same thing in an adjacency matrix, so here again, let's say for the 3, I will have to go through the whole row to find these ones. So I also will have to look at these two. So this will take me order 
v time. So again, adjacency lists are more efficient, assuming the degrees are low. Now, another operation would be checking whether a certain edge is in the graph. So asking, is uv in the graph? Now, how can I check that if I have adjacency lists? I would have to go through the adjacency list of u and see whether I can find v. So that will again take order degree of u time. So that's somewhat inefficient, at least in contrast to adjacency matrices, because there for uv, so let's say I'm asking, is there the edge from 3 to 2? I just have to look that up in the matrix, so that takes constant time. Let's have another quiz, or actually a bit of an exercise, and that is how many edges can an undirected graph with six vertices have at most? And there are some options here, 15, 18, 30, 36. And here are some additional questions to think about. So the first one is the same question for directed graph. So if I have six vertices, how many edges can I have? Then the same question for n vertices, undirected or directed, how many edges can I have if I have n vertices? And then as a final question, if you have to draw your graph, so let's say with six vertices, and you have to draw it in such a way that no two edges cross, how many edges can you draw? An undirected graph with six vertices can have at most 15 edges. Why is that the case? So let's have a graph with six vertices. Then if I pick one vertex, that can have one, two, three, four, five edges. Now, if I do this for every vertex, I would get 5 times 6, 30, but then I counted every edge twice, so 30 divided by 2 is 15. More generally, what we have here, if we would have n vertices, this is n choose 2. So taking unordered pairs out of a set of n objects, and that is then n times n minus 1 divided by 2. So that's an undirected graph setting. So in a directed graph with six vertices, how many edges can I have? 36. So I can have these 15, but now I can have them in both directions, so 30. And I can also have self loops, six of those, so overall 36. Or in general, in a directed graph with n vertices, I can have n squared edges. The final question here was drawing an undirected graph with six vertices but no two edges may cross. So how many edges can I get? So let me try to draw a graph. Now I have six vertices, but I can still draw more edges. I can still draw more edges. Okay, now if I would draw additional edges, they would somehow cross some edge. So how many edges do I have? I have this outer triangle three, the inner triangle three, then the connections, these three connections is another three, and then these diagonals here is another three, so that is 12. Actually, the number that I get here is 3 times n minus 6. So 18 minus 6, 12. No coincidence. Interesting here is, so this for n larger equal 3, it's a general formula of how many edges I could get in a graph with n vertices as long as they are not allowed to cross. So for instance, in road networks, except for bridges or railway networks, this is kind of the number that you would expect. And this is actually only a linear number. So these graphs are actually sparse. So there, for a street network or a railway network, you definitely want to use adjacency lists and not an adjacency matrix. That's all for this video. In the next videos, we're going to look at algorithms.